zero. folks hello and everybody i'm happy to be here with you again this is your host michael voss i am the dragon of the southern tier here on no sound bites allowed i'm glad to be back with you and of course i am here on no less than the exceptional conservative network and i'm happy to be here with you guys i know it's been a little while Uh, we started working got to be able to pay the bills keep the lights on and keep the show going and so there was a, you haven't seen me maybe on the TC, TECN network, the Exceptional Conservative Network, as often as I would like. But we're working on that. We're getting that schedule set up. So let me talk with you a little bit, because most of what I'm going to talk about today is going to deal with immigration. And there's a lot of news about that. There's a lot of stuff to talk about. But I also want to remember something that was recent news. I think a lot of people may recall not too long ago, um, actually the 4th of July weekend last week, uh, earlier this week, I should say, uh, there was Nike and Colin Kaepernick. And Nike and Colin Kaepernick decided that Betsy Ross was somehow a racist and that the flag that Betsy Ross created for the United States, often rumored to be the first flag of the United States, was somehow racist. And they justified this by saying that it was done in the 1700s during the time that our nation had slavery. And that's true. America had slavery in the 1700s. Absolutely. Even into the 1800s. Well before then, into the 1400s, there was slavery in America. That's true. Does the American flag symbolize slavery? No. Because there's been slavery around the world. And it doesn't symbolize oppression. It doesn't symbolize any kind of uh, the negatives that are being placed upon it. I mean, let's remember, Betsy Ross, you know, I'm sure Colin Kaepernick forgot about this when he was in school, but Betsy Ross, she was a Quaker. She was against slavery. She was an abolitionist, actively fighting against slavery. But he's somehow trying to connect that woman, a Quaker, someone against slavery, with slavery. He wants to connect America with slavery. And Nike somehow decided that this was all true, that they didn't bother to look at American history to remember Betsy Ross, to remember what Quakers were, a religious order that were against uh, slavery, to forget about who she was and what she had accomplished as a woman in the 1700s, where there was no right to vote, And women were often considered property. And to see that she was exemplified amongst her peers and amongst many of the men at the time of a revolution for our nation. And you want to detract from all that. So Colin Kaepernick, he's saying that this is all about oppression. He's fighting against the oppression, the oppression that's occurred here in America. And that he's fighting for the people. Okay, that may be his statement. That's what he's talking about. But I want to put this in perspective in the best way that I possibly can. Colin Kaepernick, for anyone who's trying to say that America, oppression, that people who are people of color now in America in 2019, here's a reminder. That was August 9th, 1936. And in August 9th of 1936, there was the Olympics. And Jesse Owens won his fourth gold medal. Jesse Owens loved America. Jesse Owens represented all of America. And this was a time where it was before the Civil Rights Movement. It was after, of course, the Civil War and the the 14th, 13th, uh, 15th Amendments, where we saw that slaves were freed. So, yeah, it was not a good time to be a person of color in America. And Jesse Owens loved America. Frederick Douglass, going back to 1852, loved America, stood up for America, fought for America. You know what? When I think of Nike and I think of Colin Kaepernick, I then go back and I think of Jesse Owens. You know what? Colin Kaepernick has never faced the oppression that Jesse Owens faced. 
He never had to go through the adversity that Jesse Owens went through. In 1936, Colin Kaepernick and anyone alive today in 2019, we're talking about the millennials, they have no concept. I, born in 1968, have no concept of the kind of oppression and racism that Jesse Owens had to go through, that Frederick Douglass in 1852 had to go through. And to say that today there is so much oppression, so much horror, let's think about this for a second. I mean, really, folks, let's talk about this. Colin Kaepernick, a multi-millionaire who doesn't do anything anymore. He doesn't play football. He was getting, what, $14 million to play a game. And he made his deals with Nike, giving him millions more. He's making as much as businesses make individually, okay? And he's out there. He's saying that there's so much oppression that people are people of color are oppressed in America. Well, let me guess, because Jesse Owens didn't make millions. Frederick Douglass didn't make millions, even if you were to adjust the money from, to, from 1852 to today. No, these weren't rich people. They were working class. You know what? Today, we have Cory Booker, we have uh, Senator, uh, Kamala Harris. They're both senators. They're both people of color. She ha uh, Kamala Harris happens to be a woman. And they're running for president. This is after the fact that we had Barack Obama, who's black, was president for eight years. He won re-election. We're so oppressed. We've had Herman Cain and we've had Dr. Ben Carson run for president. We have how many members of Congress that happen to be black or Hispanic or both and women or women? How many? How many? Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez? In 1936, that was not even possible. And yet Colin Kaepernick and Nike want us to think that today you are oppressed and that a flag that celebrates a nation that, a lot, that has given us the opportunity to have free speech and to grow and to make millions, millions playing a game and not even playing the game, just millions for being a person of interest in the nation. And you're going to tell me that's oppression? I'm sorry. He has no idea what he's talking about. He, he's out of his mind. He's, he's an idiot. And that's my personal opinion. But that's not what I want to focus on today because there's a lot of other things. But I do want to put that in perspective. When people want to talk about oppression, they want to talk about how bad America is. They want to talk about slavery. They have no idea what they're talking about. They don't, they're not paying attention to history. And there are definitely no way that they can make a comparison today to what we saw in 1852, to what we saw in 1936. And the fact that those individuals, individuals who were actually going through it, loved America more than Colin Kaepernick in 2019, where he has more advantages and more opportunities than they have ever dreamed of in their lifetimes, then, I, you know, it just upsets me. So I did want to talk a little bit about that since it is July 7th and we're only three days after the July 4th celebration. But I also want to talk about a couple of other things. So uh, one of the things I want to talk about here, and I want to focus mostly on immigration today. But I do also want to remind people that coming up on the 9th, Tuesday the 9th, we will be speaking with District Attorney Steve Cornwell about his run for Congress for 2020. And we'll have him here live in studio speaking with us at 1 p.m. And it should be a very interesting interview. We've already done an interview with uh, another one of the candidates in the race, George Phillips. And you can check that out. Uh, we'll have a link and you'll be able to see that. Uh, but we do invite you to join us on Tuesday at 1 p.m. when we have our exclusive one-on-one -on -one interview with District Attorney Steve Cornwell about his race in the New York 22nd District, which is poised to be a top three most watched uh, congressional race in 2020, probably going to generate about four, excuse me, 14 to $17 million for that race uh, to go up against current De uh, Congressman Anthony Brindisi. So that should be real exciting. I'm looking forward to that, and I hope you are too. But let me get to some of the meat and potatoes 
of what I want to talk about today. Because I want to talk about immigration. And immigration is an important thing. Especially, we're talking right after July 4th. So immigration really matters for America. It's, we're a nation of immigrants, for the most part. Uh, and we have millions of people. We have a line that is millions of people deep. Every year, over a million people try to come to America and or, and or come into America in the hopes of one day becoming American citizens. We currently have, your estimates can be anywhere from 11 to 22 million people who are illegally in the United States at this moment. They don't intend to become citizens. They are, by definition, by law, illegal aliens. They are not immigrants. They're not here to immigrate. They are illegal. They have broken the law. The law they broke is immigration law. They came into the United States without any documentation. This is something that I'm saying and I have to emphasize because it seems that the 2020 Democratic candidates for president, as well as many of the Democrats in the party, the Democratic Socialists, the progressives like uh, progressive leaders of tomorrow or otherwise known as PLOT, uh, Citizen Action, Indivisible New York, essentially the fringe far left of America, seem to have no idea that being an illegal alien, having broken the law, willfully breaking the law of the United States, makes you an illegal alien. They think somehow that's immigration. It's not. It's not even close to being the same thing. But they say that. And they've been forcing this. They've been trying to find ways. They've been literally encouraging people to break the law at every step. And we know this because we've seen this here in uh, just looking at California, which is a sanctuary city, with Gavin Newsom, the governor of California. And we're looking at an article from the New York Times. Uh, this article, for those who are listening in, it's when it comes to the census, the damage among immigrants is already done. Uh, this came out on June 27th of 2019. And of interest of this is that in the article, it goes on to say, quote, critics have accused the administration, meaning the White House under President Trump, of attempting to use the question on the census of American citizenship to discourage immigrant communities from participating in the census. Let's stop right there. They're not discouraging immigrant communities. They're discouraging illegal aliens okay and that's that's a big difference and that's a big difference they're discouraging illegal aliens and they should because they've broken the law and they shouldn't be rewarded but you have to ask yourself why are people like gavin newsom encouraging illegal aliens not uh, not to take the census or oh, excuse me correction to take the census to be counted along with citizens in california and we hear Governor Cuomo and many others who are also encouraging illegal aliens to be counted in the census, even though they're not citizens. Because it's about money and power. Because if you count them, then that means you get more federal taxpayer money to your state. It means that you're able to have more power in Congress. There are 53 members of Congress in the state of California because of the population. How many people would they lose? How many members of Congress would they lose? And how much power would they lose if you didn't count illegal aliens? And California is the number one location of illegal aliens in the United States. New York is number two. So imagine if they lose a million people. How many would, that would be what, three, uh, maybe four members of Congress that they would lose? Votes that they would not be able to make, laws they would not be able to enact because they no longer had citizens counting to benefit them. How many tens of billions, hundreds of billions of dollars in taxpayer money is going to California because they count illegal aliens? Individuals who are not benefiting the nation and are getting a reward because they're being counted. In New York State, it gets even worse. Because not only New York State, which is already losing population because of the bad policies enacted by Governor Cuomo, but it gets even worse when you look at it because New York is already going to lose two members of Congress. But how many more would we lose if we counted, again, if you didn't count 
the illegal aliens. In a state that has roughly 20 million people, how many people? Would it be a million? Would it be another four members of Congress? Would New York State lose six members of Congress? Imagine that. That would mean that New York State would go to 21 members of Congress and the bluest of bluest states would lose massive power in Congress and the ability to affect laws throughout this nation. It would be huge. And it would lose million, billions, hundreds of billions of dollars in taxpayer funds from the federal government. And that's a big deal. And that's one of the reasons that we saw in New York, New York passed a unwelcomed, unliked bill. They gave, uh, it was called the Greenlight Bill, and that allowed illegal aliens to be able to get driver's licenses. And it's something that a lot of the county clerks reject. And on screen, people are able to see, this is an article from the Washington Post. The title is, New York will give licenses to undocumented drivers. Some county clerks refuse to comply. Now, I want you to understand something with the green light bill. What that bill says is that they are willing to give un, what they call undocumented migrants which the document missing is any authorization to legally be in the United States. They are illegal aliens. They are criminals who are actively avoiding prosecution by the law. So these are criminals, and they are giving them a reward of a driver's license. By the way, you can't get a driver's, uh, you can't get a job without having a social security number. And the thought is, well, if you give them drivers, if you give illegal aliens driver's licenses, they'll get insurance and that will make them safer drivers. Except if they're going to and from work, and that's the reason why they have the driver's license, they can't work without committing fraud of having a social security number. So they've either stolen someone's social security number or they have, uh, they have created a fake one and they're using that. So they're committing fraud. So they're in the nation illegally and they're committing fraud to be able to have a job to drive to and from. And then they have to pay insurance. How are they paying insurance? Because insurance is also based on legal citizenship. So they have, they're have they breaking the law and any accident they might be in is a committing an insurance fraud. Because the information they're using for that is fraudulent and based on a crime, which is the crime of entering the nation. So... By doing what New York State has done, by giving driver's licenses to illegal aliens, they have, in effect, promoted crime. They're aiding and abetting criminals. This is what a sanctuary state does. They selectively pick laws to enforce, and they selectively allow other laws to go unenforced for the benefit of the state, both in terms of taxpayer money and also in terms of uh, their political power. And that's what we're seeing here with New York State. And you have to take this into uh, an understanding. These illegal immigrants, because they have a driver's license in New York State, also created by the single party, Democrats rule New York State. So that Democratic uh, state government, state legislature, also passed the voter reforms that allow, and this allows that a person with a driver's license can vote. So this is out, actually when people talk about collusion and involving foreign nationals in U.S. elections, there is nothing more direct than saying in New York State, as well as many other states, to say you have a driver's license. That driver's license automatically registers you to vote. You're an illegal alien, a foreign national who is not supposed to be in our nation, and you can go vote and we may or may not catch that after the fact. And you can influence elections from the presidential to Congress to local elections. Is that fair? It's definitely not legal. It is a problem. And yet we see our governor in New York, Governor Andrew Trump, Cuomo, has done this. And there are assembly members who passed this. And there are members of the state Senate who passed this. They were all Democrats that voted for this. One of them being Assemblywoman Donna Lapardo. And I will have Assemblywoman Donald Lepardo on. She was expected to be on July 9th. Uh, she has since canceled that interview. 
And we are looking forward to having that interview with Assemblywoman Donna Lopardo as soon as possible uh, because we're going to ask her why she voted for giving illegal aliens driver's licenses, which will allow them to vote in U.S. elections illegally. And this was something that in both April and June of 2019, polls stated over six, about 60 percent, 50, 60 percent of New Yorkers opposed doing this. So this violated the will of the public, actively did not do her job of representing the public and voted against their will and their interests. And I don't know why. But this is important because this is all building and I'm building here and I want you to follow me because if you notice, we see that sanctuary states like California uh, are actively trying to make sure people think of illegal aliens as immigrants, that they are actively trying to get them in the census so that benefits them. We see states like New York State that are actively giving driver's licenses as a reward to illegal aliens. Now, you say to yourself, well, why would they do all of that? Why would they do this? Because, quite simply, this is a benefit. This helps them. This is something they want to see happen. And it's going to help, they believe, their efforts in elections. So, and that kind of leads us to the next part of this puzzle that I'm putting together to you about immigration and how this is affecting our nation. Excuse me one second. Screen's going crazy. There we go. Uh, And that brings us to the next piece of this. So let's see. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, as in reported by The Hill, in the article states, quote, uh, rather the title is, quote, after concentration camp comparison, photographer shares photos of Ocasio-Cortez at the border. And this was published on June 25th of 2019. It didn't get a lot of attention at the time, but let's think about what that's all about. Because back on the 25th, at the same time, Gavin Newsom is trying to find a way to get uh, illegal aliens counted in the census. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, much like with Colin Kaepernick, is accusing the United States of being a concentration camp, of being Nazis, of having detainees at ICE centers being compared to the Nazi concentration camps, which is false. It's not even close. It's not even close. But you know what's the thing that's most aggravating about that? The thing that can really piss people off is that when you actually look at the photos and what she was doing to manipulate the emotions of the public, to make people think that there really is some kind of issue going on here, an issue that's bigger and worse uh, in, in her mind than it actually is. Look at the photos. And again, this is in The Hill. It's been published. You've probably seen it on Facebook. You've probably seen it on all kinds of social media. The images that you can see, and they're on the screen right now for those who are looking at the video, that's Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez looking like she's deeply troubled staring at a parking lot an empty parking lot. She's trying to say, so the image that you mostly would see would probably be the one on the left at the top and on the bottom at the right is the one where she's crying and outraged. And in fact, she put out a tweet about this saying uh, in part, and this is from Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's Twitter account, the official, uh, her official uh, uh, Twitter account, I'll never forget this because it was the moment that I saw with my own eyes that America, that the America I love was becoming a nation that steals refugee children from their parents and cages them. Wait a minute. Let's let's stop for a second. She's looking at a parking lot. She's looking at a parking lot and she's trying to tell people that somehow this empty parking lot is somehow separating children that this is the way that she wants to manipulate you so let's put some of these pieces together for a second so we have alexandria ocasio cortez aoc and many other democratic socialists and progressives that are out there saying that america's evil terrible place that we 
that our flag reminds them of racism, like with Colin Kaepernick, even though the people who actually created that flag were Quakers and were fighting against slavery. And they're completely, completely ignoring people like Frederick Douglass in 1852. They're completely ignoring people like Jesse Owens in 1936, standing up and fighting for freedom, for fighting for America and fighting against actual Nazis. They're ignoring that completely to try and give you this other message to make you think something is wrong, that some, that America is somehow evil and that illegal aliens are somehow actual immigrants, and that even though they've broken the law, absolutely broken the law, that we should ignore that and give them a reward of both citizenship, taxpayer-funded facilities like medicine and health care uh, and education in our school systems, and driver's licenses so that they can go to jobs where they must commit even more fraud and even more crimes to have that job. And this is a problem. This is a problem. Do you see the problem that's here? But it gets worse because it gets worse. Because they try and tell you, and I'm sure you've seen many, many articles of late in the last month that have been talking about, well, you know, there have been kids who've been killed on the border. You know, you had three women who were uh, three children that were and a mother who were dead on the border of El Paso in Texas. We had uh, a man and a young child that were born that were dead in the water uh, at one of the border crossings. OK, and they're, they're telling you, oh, my God, this is epic. This is epidemic levels of kinds of 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 of, of loss. And the actual reality is, if you actually look it up which I have. And if you look at the list of deaths in ICE company, uh, custody, and this comes directly from ICE, and this is from the period of October 1st, 2003, to which is right after ICE was created, until June 5th of 2017, well, you see some very interesting things. Because a lot of the recent deaths that are being attributed to ICE, people being in ICE custody, were for old age, were for people with cancer, for people who had AIDS, and for people who committed suicide. So you're, you're not seeing a lot of problems where someone was abused. In fact, you're not seeing cases of abuse. You're not seeing cases where people were starved to death, that they died because they failed to get medical treatment. You see people with terminal illnesses that are coming from countries like Venezuela and Honduras, and they're entering America illegally, Guatemala. And they're entering the United States illegally, and they're dying because the trip that they're making, some 2,500 miles to go to California. Mind you, they could go 1,500 miles to ports in Texas and be entering the United States and make a claim for asylum legally and they could do that and it would save them over a thousand miles in their travels but instead they're going to california which is a state that is welcoming and has a, a virtual no border mentality from their governor where they're welcoming and inviting these people to come into their state and that's why they're going an extra thousand miles but remember if you're coming from venezuela if you're coming from Honduras, if you're coming from Guatemala with a child, you have no food that you're carrying. Look at the caravans. We've seen them. 15,000 people at a time, many of them with children. And what do you see? There's no backpacks. They have no supplies. They're traveling without water or food. 15, they're traveling 1,500, 2,500, 2,700 miles to come into America traveling through several countries and open, open land with no defenses. They, have, they don't have clothing. They don't have shelter. They don't have food. They're doing this to children. They're taking children on this trip. If you or I in America tried to take our kid half a mile down the road to the store and that kid didn't get enough food, if his clothes weren't correct, if he didn't get a bath, Guess what? You know what would happen. You'd be up on charges of child abuse. This is, what they're, this is what's being promoted. 
They're encouraging people to come to California, to come to New York State, to sanctuary states, dragging children along with them, abusing those children. That's what it is. It's abuse. Because those kids have no food. They have no guarantee of food, water, or shelter. And even if they were to make it into America, which is not guaranteed, they have no, no uh, promise of food, water, or shelter unless they get caught by ICE officials. And then America tries to take care of them as the best they can. And as we have reported many times, we're seeing that because these nations and these travels are so dangerous, people are coming into America without immunizations. And we see that 6,500 cases, according to the CDC, 6,500 cases of measles has outbreak, uh, broken out in Venezuela. And we see mumps and measles, 10,000 new cases just in the past year have come in Brazil. And we're seeing South America have, be affected by this and all across the, the southern borders, we're seeing increases of these kinds of diseases that are now entering into the United States. And suddenly we're having a rash of cases where illegal immigrants, where we've seen that they have been isolated in over 35 uh, detention centers because of diseases, communicable diseases that they have to protect the rest of the American public about 900 individuals, if I remember that correctly. And we're trying to protect America from these diseases of individuals who are coming across our borders. And then people are screaming, well, ICE is so bad because people are dying. And they're not dying. And these aren't unknown numbers. We've seen this happen before under President Obama in 2009, 2011, 2012. Again, we have the data. It's here. And these numbers are down from 2003, 2004, 2005, but we have it. And look at the natural causes that I have on the screen. Now, excuse me, the causes of death on the screen. We have people who were born in 1989, uh, 1976, 1969, 1967, 1965. Uh, we have individuals who are in their 50s and 60s who have traveled on foot thousands of miles without food, water, or shelter, or proper amounts of food, water, and shelter, and they're dying. They're dying from natural causes. They're dying from uh, complications of pulmonary tuberculosis. They're dying from hypertensive cardiovascular disease. That's a heart attack. They're dying from a sudden cardiac death. That's a heart attack. They're committing suicide. They're dying from rabies. I mean, this is what we see here, and these are things, and this is in 2013, the cases that I'm speaking about right now. 2013, we had individuals that were dying from Mexico and Canada, Jamaica, Antigua, uh, Mozambique, Honduras, Guatemala. I mean, the guy died in, he was born in 1985, died of rabies in 2013 in an ICE detention center. Rabies? When was the last time you heard of an American dying from rabies? Which tells you what we're really dealing with here. This is the real problem. And we see that even if we were to look currently, in April 2018, uh, there are a couple of people who have had, and ICE has to report this, and they are reporting this information. The U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, that's ICE, do report the deaths of detainees. But this isn't some kind of massive outbreak. This isn't, we're not talking about hundreds of thousands of people as um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Gavin Newsom and, uh, and Governor Cuomo that they would make you want to believe. That's not what's happening. Individuals, yeah, some of them do die. And given the fact that they're dying from heart attacks, at 50, 60, 70, I've seen uh, another individual that was 80 years old after traveling 2,500 miles without food, water, or clothing. Yeah, I'm not surprised. But that brings us back to the question, why would anyone, 50, 60, 70 year old people, we're not talking about athletes and sports, we're, we're talking about just regular people. You would imagine if you had to go 2,500 miles over open, rough terrain without guarantee of food, water, clothing, or shelter, 
And at the end of 2,500 miles, you then go through a desert, which is most of the southern border of the United States, and go through that scrub brush to finally run into an ICE officer who get, then takes you to a detainee center where you can get medical aid. Do you think you might have uh, some heart issues? That you might have some medical issues? You might have some malnourishment? you think you might die because you'd be weak? Because that's what's happening. And that's grown adults. Amazingly, we're not seeing more children die while going through this very same process. But they say this to make you wonder. And now it gets really bad. Okay, so we understand. They're inviting the illegal aliens into the nation to commit these, to commit crimes, which is what they're doing. They're aiding and abetting them in doing this. And then they're turning around and saying, well, because we've invited them into America with the promise of taxpayer-funded food, clothing, jobs, the ability to vote, to get medical aid, that it, the problem is on America. Well, America's bad because we're saying you got to follow the laws and that anyone who doesn't agree with that is evil. And it's gotten so bad that we saw that Cory Booker, Senator Cory Booker, who is running for president, he's an individual who just like uh, Colin Kaepernick has decided that America is just a bad nation, that we don't know how to take care of people, that we're somehow oppressive. Cory Booker decides that he's going to go out and he's going to break the law. And he did. Cory Booker went into Mexico. He is a United States senator. And he went into a foreign nation, Mexico. And he grabbed, he took with him several they call them migrants, but quite honestly, illegal aliens who had already been kicked out of America because they were illegally in the United States. And he took several of them, five women, as if reported by Newsweek on July 4th, that on July 4th, the celebration of our nation, Cory Booker broke the law by going into Mexico, finding individuals and taking them into America, not to a detention center, but to other facilities. So he, he literally, literally brought in people who did not have a legal right to be in America and brought them across the border and deposited them with uh, pro-illegal immigration organizations so that they could be in America and taught them how to make claims of asylum. And we know that they were being taught to do this because we see another example which comes from the Washington Examiner. And that is, in this article, Democratic Congresswoman secretly sending staff, her staff, into Mexico to coach asylum seekers. That was on July 5th. And that happened to be members of the staff for uh, Representative, what's her name, Elizabeth, uh, I want to get her name right, uh, Veronica, Veronica Escobar who happens to be in the district that used to be for Robert Beto O'Rourke, the fake Hispanic. So we see Democrats are actively, so it's not enough that illegal aliens are coming into the nation because they've been invited. We see members who are running for Congress, not, not only running for Congress, but running for the presidency, are actively going out and grabbing people, teaching them how to circumvent the law and allowing them to break the law in the United States. Now, this is the state of immigration in America today. And if you have not been terrified by this, I don't know what will. I am terrified. This is not what the 4th of July is about. This is not what America is about. We're not a nation of broken rules and chaos. We're not a, a nation where people who are looking to be elected and to maintain political power get to pick and choose what laws they want to find. You don't get to have a sanctuary city and say, well, we're going to follow this law, but not that law. By the way, give us your taxpayer money and let us have our political power to try and change laws the way we want them to. It doesn't matter what the public wants. It doesn't matter what is the law or why there's a law. 
We just want to do that. And you should let us. Because that's what California, Washington with uh, Governor Inslee, uh, New York State with Governor Cuomo, uh, that's what we're seeing right now, is the government of these states are telling the people, you're going to deal with this, that we're going to selectively pick groups of people and we're going to place those groups of people who are illegal. They are criminals, unrepentant criminals. They're not turning themselves in. They're not going, they're not allowing themselves to get deported. They are actively, willfully breaking the law and they are more important than the citizens. And you can say that because the green light bill, New York driver's licenses for illegal aliens is a thing. And because they are fighting New York state, California, they're fighting against not counting these people in the census because it maintains power and money. And then they turn around and go, well, why is everyone upset? Oh, it's, it's because Republicans are so evil because conservatives are so evil. How about the rule of law? Let me ask you something. If an illegal alien knows that, that states like California, New York will break the law for them, and they know that they will allow them, you know, even if they commit crimes, to stay in the nation. That they will not turn them over. The, the New York driver's license law actively states three times in the bill that it will not share that information, the legal status of this individual, with the federal government, as is required by law. Which is why the county clerks are rejecting it. And you got to say to yourself, well, if they know that... Why would they follow any other law? Because the only answer they're going to say is, well, I'm an illegal alien, so it's okay. Because you want me here. Because you want my vote. You want my body so that you can get more taxpayer money from everyone else in America. That's the trade-off. That these illegal aliens get to continue to break the law and get to get rewarded with health care and jobs and driver's licenses, uh, things that they're not supposed to have, and they're going to get rewarded for that because they provide those Democrats, those progressives, those Democratic socialists like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the power and the money that they want. And for all of that, they're going to exchange it and they turn around to you and say, and if you don't like it, you're a racist. It's your, you are the problem. If you follow the law, if you believe that states and cities should follow the law, if you don't think your taxpayer dollars should fund and encourage individuals to break the law selectively, then you are the racist. It's your fault. You're the problem. I, I don't agree with that. I, I think it's ridiculous. And I don't think anyone's really broken it down and put together. These are the things that are happening. No, no, no. That's not what you're hearing about when you hear about all of this in government. What you hear instead is Colin Kaepernick saying that you're just some kind of racist and that Nike celebrating the United States on the 4th of July. Well, that means you're a racist as opposed to back in August 9th of 1936 when Jesse Owens was proud to be an American and was actually fighting Nazis. And fighting the oppression that Colin Kaepernick has never existed, never had in his life. It doesn't even exist anymore. The level of oppression that may have existed in 1936 doesn't exist anymore today. It doesn't. Fighting the fight against racism was won. More than anything else, it's been won. We've improved at every metric. Can it be better? Absolutely. But we've improved it. It is better no one in 2019 is receiving the kind of oppression that Jesse Owens did in 1936. And yet we have less people who are appreciative of the nation that we have. And we have more people who are willing to go out there and like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and, and abuse our nation and tell us how evil we are for being able to have the money and the quality of life that makes 11 to 22 million, 25 million illegal aliens come into our nation every year or to stay in our nation every year. You know, it, I think I, I saw this. Uh, There's a funny caption that I saw the other day and it said, you know, if the detention centers were actually concentration camps, which they're not, as I've shown you with the ICE data itself, they're not, not even close. But if they were, 
This would be the only nation in the world where people have actually broken into, they are actively breaking the law to get into those detention centers. It's the first time in the world. So there you go. That should tell you something about how great America is and how off people like the Democratic Socialists, the Progressive Leaders of Tomorrow, otherwise known as PLOT, the uh, Citizen Action, the uh, Indivisible New York, how wrong they are because they don't seem to get it. That people are breaking into this nation, breaking the law to get into these detention centers that they want to make people believe and feel emotionally like they're concentration camps when they're not. And members of Auschwitz know that. Uh, survivors of Auschwitz, excuse me. And why the government of Poland asked Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to go to Poland to see the concentration camps so that she would actually understand what the difference is. And she, of course, said no. But what does that all lead up to? What does this all bring us to? What is the end result of all of this? Of watching sanctuary states invite illegal aliens to break our law, to selectively pick and choose which laws they're going to have, to demand that you, the taxpayer, pay for them breaking the law, for giving rewards like driver's licenses and jobs to illegal aliens. What is the end result? The end result is that we get to see the polling and we get to see which candidates are winning and losing in the elections. And at the moment, we see that people like uh, Kamala, Kamala Harris, Elizabeth Warren, they're winning. We've seen that Joe Biden has gone from a commanding lead with over, uh, he was ahead by oh, 15 points, but the old white rich man has been dropping. His time is over. That Bernie Sanders, who was, no, had been on second place consistently, is now dropping because he is an old white rich man, even though he claims to be a socialist. And he's losing favor. And instead, we have Kamala Harris, who's running up. We see Elizabeth Warren, Warren moving forward. We see uh, those are the four people who are really having an impact because they're promising everything. If you want to be an illegal, if you want to be an illegal alien, don't worry. Elizabeth Warren, Kamala Harris, they're going to take care of you. It's okay to have a sanctuary city. In fact, they believe it's important. Oh, you have a you have college debt. Don't worry, it's going to disappear. They're going to wipe that out. I don't know who's going to pay for it. And you know who's going to pay for it? You are. Did you pay for your college education already? Guess what? You're going to pay for someone else's. You don't go to college? You're going to pay for someone else to go to college. That isn't related to you. That isn't one of your kids. You're going to pay for it in your taxes. Because the money isn't just disappearing. And as much as Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez says we should just print money and turn ourselves into a banana republic to devalue the money and get rid of the quality of life of America, because that's what it means. I mean, she's an econ she studied economics in college. You would think she would know that's what that means. But no, she doesn't. But that's what we're seeing. The Democratic candidates for 2020, they're promising everything. They're giving nothing. And the backbone of everything is based on immigration. Because if you have the ability to control how many people are coming into the nation illegally, and you have the ability to count those people in your advantage as counted as citizens. You get more taxpayer money. You get more power. You get more ability to abuse the system and to enslave, literally, it winds up enslaving every other American, economically as well as politically. And if you keep people distracted by saying, like Colin Kaepernick and Nike, that, oh, they're the good guys because they remember that there was slavery at one point in America, but they can't remember that there were people like Frederick Douglass and Jesse Owens who loved America and fought against the oppression they're talking about and did so so that people like Colin Kaepernick can make $14 million. People like Barack Obama could become president. That people like Kamala Harris and Cory Booker could run for president. You know what? Something's skewed here. 
This is about immigration. It is. It's about America. It's about what's going to happen. Back in October of 2018, on this show, we said that we believe that Kamala Harris and Elizabeth Warren were most likely going to be president, vice president, some mix up of that. And that it's going to be an all woman format to go up against President Trump for the 2020 election. I stand by that. I believe it. And I believe it, the, the approach is going to be, well, it's the women against that evil monster Trump. And anything that he says is either going to be racist or it's going to be some kind of misogynist statement, no matter what he says. And no matter how well the economy does, it's never going to be enough because you haven't gotten rid of everyone's debt. Even if you decided to uh, go to college and become uh, uh, get a master's in lesbian dance theory, which is actually a course. Because that's so popular and it has so many applications in the real world in getting a real job. Yeah. That's what we're looking at. And we're going to selectively pick people, sometimes by color. There is Elizabeth Warren, excuse me, Kamala Harris, is now saying that we should, the government, should selectively pick people based on their skin color to get benefits in buying houses. She specifically wants to spend $100 billion to help black individuals, black Americans, get homes. You know what that is? That's racism. That's racism. Because you're selecting a group of people based on their skin color alone without any other qualification to receive a benefit from taxpayers. And if I had said that the, anyone in government wanted to give $100 billion to white people to do anything, everyone would scream that it's racist. Guess what? Change the color and it's still racist. It just means that they like being racist when it benefits a group that they think will vote for them. Folks, we got to pay attention. America's, uh, this is our nation and we can have this democracy. We can have uh, this representative government as long as we want. And we are the greatest nation in the world. We have the highest quality of life. We will be able to maintain that as long as we want if we pay attention. If we realize that these things are connected. I started with Gavin Newsom, started with the sanctuary cities, and it all ties together to the same thing at the end of the day. Who's in power? Who's getting the money? And that goes from the 2020 election to everything else. Now, you may disagree with this, and I've gone into great detail on it. You may disagree with it. Please tell me why. I'd love to hear it. But I believe... I've been very clear, and I think it makes a lot of sense. It's a compelling thing to think about. And I do look forward to hearing from Plot and Citizen Action, Indivisible, New York, the progressive left, the democratic socialists. If they think I'm wrong, hey, tell me how. Because I'm pulling the evidence that's out there for everyone. And I'm just paying attention and looking at the consequences, not the emotions, the consequences of what they're actually saying and what they're actually doing. Because you can promise anything you want. They're promising that your money, you know, don't worry, I'm going to pay everyone, Andrew Yang, I'm going to pay everyone $1,000. Except when you look at the details, no, he's not. And where's that money coming from? $3.1 trillion. Where's that coming from? Who's paying that? You know, going to wipe out all college debt. Who's paying for that? What happened to the people who already did pay their debt? You know, what are the consequences of these things? And what's the consequence of encouraging people to travel 2,500 miles with children in tow without guarantee of food, water, or clothing? And, and who's responsible ultimately when that kid, that parent, that individual dies? You're going to blame it on the detention center that's trying to save their life with health care and medication and trying to take care of them? Or are you going to blame the politician in the sanctuary city that invited them into our nation to, and to take that trek in the first place? Because I tell you what, I, I think it's pretty obvious where the problem is, especially when they're doing it, not for some humanitarian good, but for their political advantage and to have more money. 
That's that's more than deceitful. It's it's just bad. But I, I want to thank you for spending this time with me for an hour. Uh, I look forward to speaking with you again soon. Please remember, uh, on Tuesday, July 9th, we're going to be speaking with uh, Steve Cornwell, who is currently the district attorney of Broome County and is running for the Congress of the New York 20. He's running for the New York 22nd congressional seat. Uh, and he'll be our guest, a one-on-one -on -one with him live here on No Sound Bites Allowed. I hope everyone enjoyed it, and I look forward to speaking with you again very, very soon. All right. Bye-bye.